with, with like leader. Thank you and uh, welcome everyone to the cabinet meetings held this afternoon. My name is John Lester and I'm leader of the council and so I'll be chairing this meeting. In addition to those councillors present in the room, um, let me just check that we have any councillors attending via Zoom. Oh, we have Councillor Crockett. Councillor Crockett, can you hear us? And can you see us? Good afternoon, Leader. Uh, yes, I can hear and see you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, welcome to the meeting. So, um, we have also in attendance cabinet members and also group leaders. We have all group leaders in attendance in the room. So, a big welcome. And do we have any more scrutiny chairs? No. Okay. Uh, we also are joined by officers, and where officers are introduced, uh, they can be introduced if called upon. So I now formally open the meeting. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on Heritage Council's website. The Council is streaming this live uh, on Heritage Council's YouTube channel and uh, making a recording. To ensure that the recording quality is maintained, please speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum. Microphones should be muted when you're not speaking. Please ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. I'm just turning to silent on my computer. Others are permitted to film, photograph, and record our public meetings, provided it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. Any members of the public attending do not wish to be filmed or photographed. Please notify a member of staff. Thank you. Um, as we move through the agenda, in addition to the discussion with the cabinet members, I would invite group leaders or their representatives to indicate if they wish to speak and provide the views of the, their group or questions. Um, where appropriate, I will also call on scrutiny chairpersons uh, to comment on behalf of their committee. I will permit uh, group leaders to speak once on each item. Voting will be uh, undertaken by a show of hands in the room. So, first of all, item one on the agenda is apologies for absence. We have uh, apologies from councillors Powell, Spodart. Uh, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Swindlehurst, Stark, and Vegan, and Powell. Any more apologies? Councillor Mason. Councillor Mason, thank you. <laughs> Then right to two, which is declaration of interest. Are there any schedule one, schedule two, or other interests for items on the agenda today? No. Okay, thank you. Agenda item three is uh, minutes of the previous meeting, which was uh, the, the meeting of the 28th of September. No matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer. Uh, cabinet members, are you confident that the content, sorry, that the uh, 28th of uh, September minutes are an accurate record of the meeting? Okay, thank you. The minutes of the meeting on the 5th of October will be considered at the cabinet meeting on the 23rd. The next item on the agenda is uh, agenda item four, which is to receive any questions from members of the public. Members of the public have the opportunity to submit questions to the cabinet in writing ahead of the meeting. We have received two questions for this meeting, and responses have been published as supplement to the agenda papers. Those who have submitted questions have been given the opportunity to submit a written supplementary or to attend the meeting to ask their question live. Supplemental questions uh, can be no more than one minute in length and must include a question. Um, so I'd now I'd like to ask the clerk to confirm how many supplementary questions we have received. Um, <clears throat> we've received two, one from Dr. Geeson and one from John Harrington. So okay. the first question from Dr. Geeson, the supplementary question is, thank you for your replies to my question, but I do not find your reasons for preferring the Shire Hall over May Lords compelling. In a city with so many empty retail properties, I believe putting a library in 
the Maylords would actually be a magnet to increase interest in retail and commercial opportunities nearby. My supplementary question is to ask whether you have now calculated the extra space available at the Maylords as a result of Wilco leaving, which would surely invalidate your argument that there is a slightly greater space at the Shire Hall. Thank you for that supplementary question. And answering that question is Councillor Ray. No, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gleeson for the supplementary question. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to confirm that we are currently have commercial interest in the former Wilco unit and are seeking to bring those interests into a formal letting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. The next question is written in supplementary from Don Howard. Thank you. The question is, my follow-up question for Councillor Price. Thank you very much for your response, Philip, and your clear statement around housing, which leads me again to believe that a Western bypass is not a bypass, but meant primarily be an access road to accommodate an enormous amount of housing on Grade 1 farmland around the Huntington and Bobblestock areas. You will note Worcester's fair policy of more and more roads paid for by huge housing estates in the bill, which has caused them to have significantly worse congestion than Hereford, according to the company that supplies traffic data to Google, INRIX. I think resilience, not house building, is the best case for a new bridge and all signs point east. Can you tell me precisely what we are waiting for in the ACON Eastern Crossing final report, nearly half a year after it landed on your desk? Does it does its release need to be achieved by a freedom of information request? Can I also check you and your cabinet colleagues think it is a good idea to take over the maintenance of a national trunk road bridge that had a provision on the long span of 60 years at a point that is likely to be a few years past that 60 year lifespan projection? National highways will think all their Christmases will come at once if they can dump that liability on the county. Finally, can I ask you to check with the CX and the MO the rules around due process? You appear to have not only neg neglected to allocate any funding in the Ford Capital Programme for agreed council policy, like the Eastern Crossing, but are pressing funding for items that are not agreed policy. I'm extremely concerned that you are putting the council at reputational and financial and at risk of ju judicial review by appearing to be proceeding against policy. Um, yes, I, I think um, John Harrington for this question, a supplementary question. There is so much in it, and I've had a word with the officers, and he was kind enough to give me the, the uh, draft beforehand. Um, we will require 10 days to come up with um, a, a full answer for him um, with regards to everything he asks. Um, just two points I would absolutely refute. I don't know why you think I have this report, the income report on my debt for six months, because I haven't. And I have not, this is the first place I've heard anything about um, the A49 front road being handed to the council. So um, I'm sure the officers in every part of that question will provide a full answer in 10 days. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Price, and thank you to John Harrington for the question. Um, next item on the agenda is agenda item five to receive questions from councillors. Uh, we've received no questions from councillors for this meeting. So, agenda item six is reports from scrutiny committees. We received recommendations from the Connected Community Scrutiny Committee that took place on the 23rd of October. And thank you to the uh, scrutiny committee members for their time and efforts. Um, all members of cabinet have read them. Thank you very much. Um, the responses uh, will form a part of the debate for item seven. Um, but uh, I now hand over to Councillor Charles, as the chair of that scrutiny committee, uh, to talk to us about those recommendations. Thank you. We're using the microphones again then. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, the uh, Connected Community Scrutiny Committee met on Monday afternoon um, to consider the full business case for the Shire Hall um, as a location of the Heritage Library and Learning Centre. I'm grateful to the five cabinet members who came along to the meeting and to the officers who also participated. We had, I think, a productive discussion and many detailed um, questions were asked. Sadly, most of them weren't answered. Um, and it was rather disappointing to find that uh, there was so little ability to answer the detailed questions that we were posing despite the people um, in the room. Um, the committee uh, unanimously adopted um, 12 recommendations which have been submitted to um, Cabinet and I'll go through them now and explain um, briefly the justification of these recommendations. Overall, we recommended that Cabinet consider and respond to all of these recommendations before making its decision, i.e. that a decision cannot be made until there is full clarity on all of these items. Um, Councillor Lester, I note that you have said that you will you know, discuss these recommendations in your debate on this agenda item, but actually I think it's important for transparency and due process that clarity is given in response to these questions. Um, prior to the debate and that we are clear that there is an answer to each of these questions because, after all, in accordance with the Constitution 4.5.65b, it's important that there is adequate evidence on which to base decisions and important that all relevant matters are taken into account. And the recommendations made by scrutiny on Monday are precisely to ensure that there is clarity there is sufficient evidence and that all relevant matters be taken into account. I'll give you an opportunity as I go through these one by one uh, to respond. So the first recommendation of the Connected Community Scrutiny Committee was that uh, Cabinet needs to clarify and include in the Shire Hall business case the full costs of cancelling mail order orchards, including the implications of decapitalization on revenue budgets. Now it became apparent during the meeting that the likely aborted cost of the mail order project would be getting on for a million pounds, but it was not possible for the cabinet member at that point to provide the detail on it. Are you now able to clarify that figure? Look, Councillor Charles, this is not another scrutiny meeting. Um, I would appreciate it if we just, you presented the recommendations and then the cabinet will give due weight to those recommendations in our debate. Yeah. The recommendations call for more information. When are you going to provide that information, Councillor Lester? I've just made my decision clear, that's the chance. Your position appears to be that you will not provide answers for the recommendations of scrutiny prior to taking a decision, and that you therefore intend to proceed with taking a decision without adequate evidence on which to it. We'll be considering the, I, I, I don't want to have a debate here, Councillor Charles, with respect, um, we will be considering all of the recommendations whilst we're having a debate about the decisions that we're going to take in the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Is, is there any... I'm not trying to have a debate, I'm asking you to answer questions. Well, to respond to the recommendations. Yes, and we will respond to those recommendations in our debate. Thank you. So recommendations. Number one, clarify the full cost of cancellation of mail or orchards. Number two, publish the full breakdown of the £4.2 million pound okay. cost of the phase one refurbishment of Shire Hall. Number three, Publish the estimated costs of phase of two to five of Shire Hall refurbishment. <coughs> this is because the May Lord's project is dependent on this expenditure in order to progress. It's not a three million pound project, but a likely eight million pound project. Number four, recalculate the benefit cost ratio of the Shire Hall proposal to include the cancellation costs of the May Lord's orchard and the four point two million phase one refurbishment costs required to make the library viable. Number five, include full costs of operating Shire Hall in the revenue budget to enable a comparison between both business cases because the scrutiny committee was surprised to note that uh, quite a significant portion of the revenue costs of the Shire Hall option were not included because they are supposedly paid by another budget line, but both, both types of costs still come to the council. So it's important to compare like with like, not to massage figures to make one option appear more viable than another. Number six, ensure that the Shire Hall risk matrix included detailed mitigation of risk of risks. Members of the committee were concerned 
at the mitigation column just appear to give further clarification of what the risks were, rather than actually specifying what would be done to address them, uh, particularly um, key risk. Number eight, remove the recommendation to cancel May Lord Bilton project at this stage. It was pointed out by members of the committee that by including a recommendation to cancel May Lord's orchard, uh, the cabinet would be effectively tying the hands of John Brown Ward and Dealer, and that actually those uh, bodies ought to be given the option to uh, express a preference for either. Number nine, clarify anticipated commercial revenue from the events because the commercial case was not clearly made. Number 10, ensure that the business case makes sure that the proposed library is a welcoming place for all users, regardless of their accessibility needs. There is concern expressed in the scope of the uh, management case that insufficient uh, focus has been given to addressing accessibility. 11, reconsider how the project can maximize carbon reduction, e.g., through insulation and glazing, in line with the Council's net zero commitment. There was significant concern expressed that, in contrast to the museum's project, where major efforts are being made, to renovate a historic building in line with Council's net zero commitments. In the case of the full business case that was before us for the Shire Hall, no such efforts whatsoever had been made, in particular concern that the Cabinet member expressed a personal commitment specifically not to do anything on this front, which appears to be in direct contradiction with Council policy. Number 12, include and identify the cost of measures to improve pedestrian accessibility to the site. There was cross party concern in the room on the committee around. Uh, difficulties of pedestrian access to the site. In summary, many questions were raised about the strategic, economic, financial, commercial and management aspects of the full business case. Um, and our recommendations uh, request information that we believe as a committee is essential to be fully considered before the government would be in a position to make an informed decision on this matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Johnson. Uh, once again, thank you to the committee as well uh, for all of those recommendations and the thought they gave to uh, the decision before us. So, agenda item seven is the review of the comparison of the four business cases for both Shire Hall and Main Hall Orchards as locations for a future <coughs> Perfect City Library and Learning Centre. So, the item is to um, present the full business case. Um, and to compare it against the legal business case uh, of Adels. And um, I would like to uh, start the debate for cabinet now and uh, introduce Councillor Bramer to uh, make his opening statement comments. Thank you, Leader. Um, Hereford Library uh, needs a new home as Hereford Museum is being redeveloped in Broad Street with the aid of large uh, lottery and other grounds which will in time make this a world-class museum in Herefordshire. A review took place in June 23 to find potential locations for the library and learning centre and up to 12 potential sites. The report in July 23 identified two preferred sites, Maylor's Orchards and Shire Hall. On the 20th of July, Cabinet agreed a full business case for Shire Hall developments which would be considered against existing plans for Maylord's Orchard and report back to the cabinet in October 23. Capital funding is sought, subject to full council approval and stronger town board subject to agreement. Some revenue uplift will be required to meet the increased staffing of the larger library, no matter which location is chosen. Seven criteria for comparison were agreed between the preferred locations. Two, uh, tours of Shire Hall for councillors and from town board members took place in August and September. Ten or more stakeholders were engaged on the opportunities to locate to Shire Hall. Many positive views re Shire Hall came forward, and there were no views or comments expressed preference for Maple mm -hmm. Orchard. Locating to Shire, the Shire to Shire Hall will bring a valuable heritage asset back into continued community use. Delivered by comparison, 600, sorry, 862 square meters of floor space compared to 674 at Maylord's, 405 square meters of library space compared to 266 at Maylord's, and 191 square meters of learning center space 
compared to the 79 only at Mayles. Being, it will bring under one roof a library, adult learning, health and wellbeing, and community services. Provide residents with access to sensory learning, digital skills, space, maker space, and business development advice in a series of dedicated spaces. It will provide a dedicated event space in the assembly hall, enabling a broad reaching and quality cultural program. It will provide income opportunities through a higher space and events in the assembly hall. And in respect to value for money, the cost for the benefit cost ratio for Maynard was calculated at 2.3, while Shire Hall surpasses this with 2.7. In my view, there is no doubt that Shire Hall will provide Herefordshire with a world-class library to match the world-class museum we are planning in Goldsmith. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bramer. And I, I would like to thank officers for all of the hard work that they've done over the few months to prepare the reports and, and pro progress the, the, the idea so that we're in a position to make uh, a further decision. It's it's clear that the business case uh, shows that there are great advantages of putting the library and learning centre into a shire hall, and it's very attractive. I think it will enable the council to elevate the status of the library and learning centre and put it in the heart of the civic centre and give it the prominent setting it deserves. The shire hall is a landmark building, and we're right to feel proud of it as a major heritage asset that we can cherish. Within the Library and Learning Centre into Shire Hall also gives us the scope to improve the offer. And this has been highlighted by the business case. So I think overall it's a very attractive proposal, and we're right to vote in favour of the recommendations before us. We, we want the library to shine, and therefore, what better location than in such an iconic building? We, we've heard the recommendations of the scrutiny committee, and I, as, as I've said, I thank them for their time in deliberating the issues. Um, there are some recommendations that request further information, and we, we can provide this. Um, there is a recommendation uh, to remove the, the recommendation to Council Mail and Orchard's project at this stage. Um, I appreciate the reason for adding this recommendation, and so. I would recommend cabinet that we remove section D from the cabinet recommendation before us. There are some uh, other considerations that I would like the cabinet to uh, discuss with regard to the other recommendations that we put forward. Obviously, the cost of the projected cost of putting uh, renovating Shire Hall is a consideration, but it doesn't or shouldn't form part of the business case when the business case is focused on the advantages of, of cycling the library in China. Uh, so whilst I appreciate that recommendation, I don't think it's something that will affect the cost uh, benefit cost ratio of the shark hall. Just in the same way that we 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 wish to the business case nor the landlord orchards didn't consider the, the cost of uh, purchasing the lease of the building. The, there were some really good points made about the <clears throat> risk register, uh, especially the point about the mitigation. Um, and I think that was a was a I think it's a point that Councillor Hitchener made, and uh, I think that's a really good, uh, good uh, issue to raise as a risk. So, Councillor Bramer, where at the scrutiny the, the matter was raised about um, addressing the possible risks associated with finding. Specialist contractors, are you, are you satisfied that there is sufficient mitigation for that risk? Uh, yes, Peter, I am satisfied specifically in terms of specialist contractor requirements or volatile, uh, volatile construction market. This is an accepted as a risk, and the mitigation is that the product team will work with the Council's Commercial Services team and our appointed construction consultant to understand the market for such contractors. However, this is a relatively small area. Uh, of risk that isn't that isn't covered with the everyday uh, <laughs> works that, uh, that companies to, to whom we normally provide uh, large contracts of, uh, of this kind, uh, they would be fully uh, 
fully um, aware of these uh, the kinds of things for which they're uh, needing to look out in this kind of building. But uh, I say this is covered by the Council's Commercial Services team. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gaddy. Thank you, Leader. Um, I watched this scrutiny meeting <laughs> via YouTube, um, and you get a very different perspective on the debate when you do it in such a way. I believe the debate was informative, helpful, and the scrutiny did what it says <clears throat> on the tin. However, I continually heard the words comparison and compare when referring to whether the library and learning centre should be located in Maylord Orchards or Shire Hall. Would the leader agree that little or no consideration was given to the fact that you cannot compare these two buildings? This is like comparing apples with pears. When considering the options for locating the library, we are looking at Maylord Orchards opened in about 1987 in the main an unimpressive indoor shopping center similar to many built across the country during the 80s and 90s and you're comparing that with shy hall built around 1897 which is an iconic building representing the heritage of our city this is an opportunity to breathe life back into a building which has been mothballed for four years and is in a poor state of repair. This building would be able to house a state-of-the-art library and learning centre. If the decision taken by council is to locate the library in Maylord Orchards, then would the leader advise me as to what use Shire Hall could fulfil, bearing in mind that there was concern at scrutiny about putting entertainment into Shire Hall, which would compete with Courtyard? Or would we continue to mothball Shire Hall? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. You know, you've raised some really good points there. Um, I think one of the key considerations, obviously, for us is where's the best place to put the library? And as I've said, to put the library in the Shire Hall is a great opportunity to put it right in the heart of the civic centre of Hereford. It's an iconic building. I think it's older than you suggest, though. I think it was 1817 it was first built. Added, added, to, added, to, added, to, added, to, yeah, added to later on, and, and the assembly hall was added to later on. But um, a very historic building in the centre of it. It's older than you and I, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, a lot older. So, comes from the nice <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. And Council a, Matthews. But not Council Matthews. Oh, not oh, Council Matthews. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Uh, it's much older. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, it's much older than all of us, but it is a, an iconic building. And, and I think the, the value of putting the library in such a prominent place it, is its own, it, it speaks for itself, in my view. But there is the opportunity, of course, to invest. In a key asset and give that child a, 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 a use that it deserves. Uh, and, and it really puts library services on the map, in my view, but it also gives a very long term use for the Shire Hall <laughs> when before, uh, when, when this was being considered by others uh, at different times, the, the overall future use of the building wasn't necessarily being determined. Here we have a great opportunity to marry putting a library in the right place so that it's got lots of learning, uh, resource space, uh, and put it in a very prominent place, but it also gives it that purpose, that building, that purpose, which would be a purpose that would be, in my view, in perpetuity. And that's the great advantage of doing that. And if we if we didn't go to Shah Hall, what would we do with Shah Hall? That, would we that... last ball it, or what? Well, I, th I think the I think the most important thing is that this council's got lots of responsibilities, and one of those responsibilities is being a custodian of such a key building. We would have to, we will, we will want to renovate it. We can't 
let such a historic building just sit there and do nothing. So it's absolutely right that we consider that as one of our key objectives. But here we have an opportunity to um, put the library in a really positive space that will bring all of those benefits that the report has highlighted. And I think it's too much of a good opportunity to miss. Thank you. Councillor Dix. Thank you, Leader. Um, it's been mentioned before and we've been talking about this that, that Shire Hall is um, offers us an opportunity for a permanent home for the library, so about 100, 100 plus years. Would you say the same if we located in Mayor of Orchard? Uh, if I recall, it was a comment I made that scrutiny when this came before scrutiny the, the first time around is that if the library went to the Shire Hall, um, do I see that being a very long term thing? Yes, I do. If it went to Maylors, do I see that as being a very long term thing? No, I don't, um, because situations change. But Maylors is a, a really important commercial centre, and there will be lots of opportunities moving forward uh, to, to maximise its, its use for the council and provide that retail and commercial opportunity that it presents and continues to present with all of the occupants in there. Uh, and who knows what issues will come along in terms of retail and, and commerce and uh, opportunities come along. And, and so therefore, it, it could happen down the line that, you know, life is not best placed in Maylors because of wanting to create better opportunities for Maylors. But where we look at child, we know that it's a civic building will always be used for a civic purpose. And so for all that marries with the ambition of finding a permanent home for the library that we can be secure about making that decision that we know it's a decision for the very long term. That's um, all right. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, I attended the scrutiny meeting on Monday just to listen to other people's views and then take some uh, comfort from what was being said. Um, the Shire Hall is an iconic building. It's the responsibility of the local authority for its maintenance and finding a future use for it. That's probably the reason why it currently has a low asset value. The opportunity of using such a great building for a valuable service to the public of Herefordshire is here now. That can provide a great facility and bring one of our buildings right in the centre of Hereford into point of use and create a valuable asset. Much has been made about the dark and imposing nature of the current building. I believe this building can be brought back to use and create the best opportunity for the future library and resource center. I disagree with the negative aspects of this. I quite like this as an attractive place to visit. The comparisons of the options we have to review today, in my mind, the Shire Hall is the right place to position the future library and gives future uses in the building alongside the library. The VCR is positive and has been produced through the correct processes that we can be confident in using these figures. Uh, one of the things, uh, recommendations from scrutiny was um, recommendation 12 about accessibility to the trial hall in Peter Square. Um, I asked the officers to go and have a look to see what we had planned, because I'm sure there were plans, and um, uh, the Hereford Master Plan or St. Peter Square area. And there are, and it's um, they're, they're public. So um, the question about crossing the road, the bus station in front of it, that was being addressed within the Hereford Master Plan. So I think this is this building, this is the probably, unless something else comes along, the best opportunity for using a fantastic building to put a long life library in it. So you know, I'm very supportive of this as an option. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Price. Councillor Sollard. Thank you, Lisa. I'd like to take the opportunity to, to provide my capital with my opinions on a financial case in support of the uh, use of the car hall for a future location. Given the decision taken today by Cabinet, solid comparison of all school business cases, we need to agree that the Shah Hall is the better location, then essential refurbishment works to the building will be required bring uh, the library into function. The cost estimate that critical work in the Shire Hall of 4.2 million pounds for phase one 
and as £1.2 million pounds, which is already approved in the capital program, <coughs> the revised cost of £2 million pounds will be included in the capital works program to be submitted to the full council in December. Selected place scrutiny at recommendation two asks for publication of a full breakdown of the £4.2 million pounds cost of the phase one refurbishment of the fire hall. The cost estimates for phase one are as follows. Build works, £2.79 million. Pounds. Design and preliminaries, 682k. Inflation, 113k. Fee, risk, and contingencies, 1.178 million. On costs and allowances, 140,000 pounds, giving a total of 4.194 million pounds. I'm not able to provide any further level of detail at this stage as it might weaken any future competitive process. At recommendation one from the county scrutiny, uh, we were asked that we clarify and include in the Shahal business case the full cost of cancelling yellow portraits, including the implications of decapitalization and revenue budgets. As agreed, uh, the methodolo- sorry, as agreed in the methodology papers on the Shahal full business case, following the capital decision on the 20th of July 2023, the full business case was prepared, and I quote, as a standalone report. Exploring the potential of the Shah Hall on its own merits, it will focus solely on the proposed library and learning center development, the Weaver Stage 2. Acknowledging that this is part of a wider project to bring the whole Shah Hall building back into use. It will consider the assembly hall and undercross spaces and the wider keywords required to enable access and operation of these parts of the building only. Cost estimates for the full capital works of the Charhol building will be developed in conjunction with this full business case and provided as contextual information. A standard full business case template is used as their all from the projects, which meets the requirements of the government's green post. Therefore, the full cost of capital in the Oregon project were not included in the Charhol full business case. The referral of work to the Charhol is clearly a dependency but the full business case is about placing the library and the learning center into the allotted space within the shell hole, just as the full business case for mineral and orchards was about placing it into that allotted space. The full sum call for the mineral and orchard projects, unfortunately, will require to remain confidential at this stage due to the ongoing negotiations with contractors. Whilst there is acknowledged that there will be some costs in respect to mineral and orchards, if should that be the decision to take today, I would like to remind my colleagues that this cabinet takes a strategic viewpoint and that value for money means using resources effectively and efficiently and safeguarding the council's assets in their entirety. Thus, in regard to the sunk costs, which are undesirable, the right decision that will be provided by the world class library. I would like to remind my colleagues that the original 3.5 million million library budget was funded from three, point, uh, from three million pounds from the towns and a half million pounds from Hereford, uh, Hereford Council Capital Receipts Reserve. Over a stronger town's top flight, approximately 60k to pay for management costs, but the final award was actually 2.439633. Therefore, it has been assumed that the future budget of, Char- of the Charbon Library with £3.005 million pounds funded from the remaining capital funding, i.e. £3.5 million, less the 438.3k and the 60.4k tops loss. And I would like to emphasize that that's the funding that will support all the works necessary to open the library service provision. At one of these connected community scrutiny, recommendation four was to recalculate the PCR of the Charhold proposal. To include the cancellation costs of Miller's orchards and the 4.2 million phase one reversion cost required to make the library viable. All heritage of stronger town funds projects are independently modeled and analyzed as part of a benefit cost ratio exercised by Rose Regeneration. This methodology has been considered and agreed by Chamberlain Walker, working on behalf of the central government. To allow a fair comparison with Neil Lawrence Orchards, the new Charhold full business case was independently analyzed by Rosary Generation using this same government model. This is an independent process with no council involvement. 
The assessment of economic benefits for this town's fund scheme has been undertaken in full compliance with the latest Her Majesty's Treasury Green Book of 2020 and relevant department guidance, such as leveling up uh, housing and committees. The economic modeling includes a number of monetized benefits consistent with government guidance, and these include regeneration benefits, social benefit skills, enterprise and tourism, and cultural benefits. The additional factor in the BTR calculation. Sorry, the additionality factor in the DCR calculation is 66% as stated on page 47 of the full business case. The additionality factor of 0.65 in table 18 was written in error, but the calculation has been made using the correct additionality factor of 66%. I would also like to note that this is the same error which exists in the middle of orchard full business case. The methodology used in the BCR calculation for Carhold full business case is wholly consistent with all plans fund projects. Rose regeneration confirmed that no extraneous cost, for example, building repair costs or purchase costs, were used in the mail order orchards full business case calculation or any of the other 15 towns fund projects. So they are immaterial to the overall calculation and should not. I repeat, not to be included. And therefore, as I say, I'd like to make count whether the Miller's Orchard's PCR did not include the cost of 4.147 million to purchase the lease of Miller's Orchard's, and therefore, in maintaining a level playing field, we will subsequently not be recalculating the PCR. I turn down to the Collective Places Scrutiny at Recommendation 3, which suggested that we publish the estimated costs of phases 2 to 5 of Garhol Refurbishment. The continued phase refurbishment project of Gar Hall does not form part of the Gar Hall full business case and has not yet been agreed. As stated at the scrutiny committee, the phase one refurbishment work will bring the whole building back into use. And I'd like to move on to the cost of moving the library service from Broad Street to either Miller's Orchards or Gar Hall. That both of those locations will require an increase in revenue budgets. As the, foot, as the footprint of the library in both locations is greater, and the provision of the learning center is a new provision. <clears throat> the increased revenue cost for Mailos Orchards is estimated at £515,973, and for Shah Hall, £390,077. Both four business cases indicate that additional staffing will be required, and this will form part of the annual budget planning for the service. The difference in the cost for the service between the two locations beyond staffing mainly relates to rent and rates, service charges, utility cleaning, and telephones, which are associated primarily with Miller of Orchards as a commercial center. If commercial tenants occupy the allocated space in Miller of Orchards, then they will cover the service charges together with paying non domestic rates, with the council expecting to receive in excess of 55k per annum. I would now to turn to Connected Places Scrutiny Recommendation 5, which requested us to include full cost of operating Char Hall and the revenue budget to enable a comparison between both business cases. An operational revenue budget currently exists for Char Hall. But whilst it is true to say that the use of the site is limited at this time, some aspects will show very little variance. For example, the main building is currently heated by a single pipe system, meaning the heating is either on or off. To ensure that the buildings do not deteriorate, and in recognition that an area is still manned 24 7, the heating is turned on in line with normal operational cycle. We would look to see a reduction in future heating costs as part of our decarbonization, decarbonization work. The revenue budget table set out in the cabinet report covers the library service cost associated with the Heritage uh, Library and Learning Centre occupying either site. If all operational costs would be factored into the far the far whole full business case, then further work would need to be undertaken for both business cases, as the full business cases are either, for other locations have never included the wider asset costs. So in that respect, they are actually both equitable. For clarity, the 42k figure shown in the proposed service revenue budget to occupy Miller's orchards is to cover off payments of non-domestic rates and the raw heading that said rent rates. As I certainly find out, no rental was intended to be charged. Thus, if, if the uh, the library and learning centre occupies no those orchards, 
However, all operational costs for occupation of helicopters need to be budgeted for as there is a new cost to the council. In conclusion, from the financial perspective, the chart holds full business case as a BCR of 2.7 as against a BCR of 2.3 for middle of orders. And it is in light of that that I strongly recommend that the financial case for this full business case clearly makes a case that the Shah Hall is the best location for the future Hereford Library and Learning Centre. And I commend this to my colleagues. Thank you very much, Councillor Sonard. Uh, you covered quite a few of the issues that were raised in the recommendations. <coughs> but I'd just like to uh, look at the last uh, three recommendations and, and, and ask um, Councillor uh, Bramer. When, when, the, when we had our discussion at scrutiny, if you look at uh, the recommendation 10, it's to ensure that the um, business case case make sure that the proposed libraries is a welcoming space for all users regardless of their accessibility needs. Um, are you happy that it's not necessary to include that in the business case when you're wanting to assess which is the best uh, location simply because wouldn't it be our intention to make any and all of our buildings as accessible as possible? Quite, uh, quite so Lena but uh, particularly here the uh... We're talking about uh, uh, the, decora the decoration and the um, and certain uh, of, of the objects that are placed in the in, in the internal areas, and uh, I mean any uh, any interior designer would make sure that the, the space that the public are going to see is welcoming. As you say, in any of our public buildings, it's not necessary, in my view, to make shire or any uh, any different. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and, and and with regard to the recommendation uh, eleven, I know you you have concerns about um, trying to retrofit listed buildings and the issues that that comes about. But surely our commitment is where where possible, we will make sure that our buildings are uh, meet all of our commitments. I think that's. Uh, I think the, the last couple of words that you used there, where possible, is the is the operative point. And there's nothing wrong with uh, <laughs> with net zero commitments and so on. But I do believe that we have to uh, realise that some buildings, especially those that have been over two hundred years ago, uh, are in themselves uh, uh, the icon of their iconic status of them is because of their uh, their quirkiness in with regard to glazing and regard to certain aspects of, of their design that were never intended to be uh, to be altered uh, to to modern requirements. Now, I have no reason to say don't do it, but if I was given my opinion as of what you should do, I would say it should be minimalistic rather than maximalistic. Would, would you agree, though, that if, if there are certain things that cannot be done? There are lots of other uh, initiatives or alterations to the building that can be made to improve the situation. Well, certainly, although Shire Hall to us and to this council is uh, a unique and uh, iconic building, to the rest of the, the world and the rest of the, this country, uh, there are thousands of such buildings which have been very sympathetically uh, brought into the 21st century. And I'm sure that Shire Hall will fulfill, fulfill that as well. Thank you. And, and just finally, for, for all cabinet members, recommendation 12 is about making sure that there's um, improved pedestrian access to the site. I mean, uh, I think I think that's something that we would really want to see. I, I would uh, I would push for uh, pedestrian access because uh, I think that that whole area of outside of Shire Hall where the <laughs> monument is, all of that is just can't be used for parades on, on certain days of the year, remembrance of others, I would think that it, it would be my intention to push for the uh, pedestrianisation of that and the buses to go slightly further away than actually outside the door of the, of the car park. So to speak. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, these things are uh, not exactly uh, vitally necessary in the first year or two of, of, of doing the Installation, but I like to think that in the time that it takes to make the uh, the 
um, the changes to Shire Hall that uh, this the pedestrian elevation could be one of the things that was finished at the same time as the library. Thank you, Councillor Brayman. Councillor Thank you, uh, I'd also like to make people aware and note that access to the Shah Hall at uh, St. Peter's Square from the Thai Town has been improved following the St. Owen uh, Street Cycle Control Works, which I'd like to acknowledge from the, uh, the previous administration, with the courtesy crossing through and from the Monarch Island. And there are also the plot the way from St. Peter's Square, to know that, and so the northern access on the Shah Hall. There have also been no improved or access reported within St. Peter's Square divinity in the last 10 years. And I therefore believe that there's uh, that no additional predicament is going to be required for consideration. Okay, okay, right. Are there any other comments or points to raise from <coughs> If not, I will go to group leaders um, so that we can uh, hear the comments that they wish to make and um, questions. So, over to group leaders, whoever would like to go first. No, that's all that is. Thank you, Leader. Um, Leader, colleagues will know, well, not all the new ones, but the one of the year before, um, that when this project was first announced, moved to Mail Old Orchard, we the two independents enthusiastically supported it. We supported it because no other option was given, and Shiro was not mentioned, which I find it very difficult to understand that it wasn't given consideration at that time. But then, nevertheless, we did support it because uh, the library was inadequate as it was. The museum was something of nothing. And once the library is moved and that can be extended, as Councillor Price normally would say, uh, then we've got a museum that's, that's value for money. Um, and that's what has been lacking. <clears throat> um, the thing is that, that uh, uh, having walked around the Shiro, I knew it pretty well before I spent many hours of my working life in the, my previous occupation in there, so I knew it pretty well. But I, there were places I didn't know thoroughly. But having walked around, it, it was amazed by the opportunities that existed in that, that building that hadn't been used and brought to the be benefit for financial return for this council. <clears throat> Uh, um, the, when it comes to the commercial case at uh, 14, the council of external consultant take the current, uh, 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 current has carried out a commercial feasibility study on the HLLC in both locations. On balance, the Shire Hall location offers more opportunities to generate income through hire of space and program of events and activities for which the library can make a charge. The Mail or Orchard location does not offer these same opportunities. And then you go on to say, <clears throat> at comparison to the Shire Hall and Mail or Orchard, uh, the Mail or Orchard, the, uh, the big part of the Shire Hall brings a valuable heritage asset back into community use. And that is something that me and my colleagues have always strongly supported. And if the library hadn't gone there, which I hope it will do now, we would have our full support. Uh, it would have cost us a lot, and we would have moved support for that to get that wonderful building brought back. So, as I say, it could make it make more visible the civic, commercial, and built heritage of the Shire Hall, connected to the wider culture and visitor attraction aspirations of the city. Um, I've <clears throat> I've always been a great admirer of that building, and it's sad that a number of locations over the uh, 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 what do you call. Um, <clears throat> a number of sorry administrations over the years have neglected it and not maintained it to the necessary high standard. Uh, but this is an opportunity to bring it back into use. And I must say, colleagues, that although looking at at the time, the mail or orchard was satisfactory to us then what was offered to us. But having seen this, and as I said, and I'll repeat, I'm surprised that that. Uh, um, alternative of the Shire Hall was brought in for the debate then. Uh, I, I thank the officers for their comprehensive report. I think the cost of this report must have been cost half the cost of renewing and upgrading the buildings because there's pages of many, many, many hours of work. So we thank them for that. But uh, um, on balance, I don't think there's any comparison and the two independents strongly support 
that the Shiloh go forward as a suitable location for the new library, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Matthews, you know, for your views and your uh, conclusions. Appreciate it. Any other group leaders wish to speak? If no other group leaders wish to speak, then we will go back to you. Go after you. Ladies first. Well, you always make out I use all the oxygen up in the room, so I was giving you the opportunity to uh, have your well, say. Well, I'll have my say. Obviously, the, the, um, the case is not that strong. Um, can I uh, just say that it's a great shame. Microphone. Sorry. We have two alternatives here for yet to be resolved. There are a number of issues that need to be um, finally bottomed out, the funding uh, and a number of other uh, another of issues and further work on the costs, I think, you know, need to be required. But, you know, the Shah Hall is important to this county as a whole. And I've yet to hear from those that oppose the Shire Hall offering what they're going to do with the Shire Hall if this isn't an option and how they're going to pay for that. Um, you know, you can have a, a, a library, maybe the library in a, in a retail centre, but I do recall I went beginning of the life of Redditch yes. Town Centre, the new development there. When it opened, and it was a buzzing, exciting place. I went there 20 minutes later, and it was a frightening place to go because it was empty. A large part of it was empty um, and was boarded up. Now, that, I hope that won't happen in May and August, but, but it has happened in many, many modern. New I'm retail development, yeah, retail shopping centre. I'm not. You talk about Kingfisher Centre. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Kingfisher Centre. Yeah. Um, you know there is that danger that could happen, and a library in, in such a situation could become a real problem. Um, as I say, as yet we need so, so a, a bit more information about about the uh, funding. And, you know, it hinges on that. As to whether it becomes viable, and I think it's more to, 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 but from my personal point of view, I think it's a more attractive option if the figures we are we have are bottomed out uh, in the future. It's a great shame that um, that we can't look at it in the in, in the round, as it were, the interest of the county as a whole. We haven't. Talked about the fact that you know that place, that charcoal has been neglected now for ten years. Um, it's been neglected and it's been mothballed now for about four or five years, mm -hmm. four years you know, coming up to five. And it's a great shame. And what we're going to do with it, I don't know. The fact that you say it's got a low value, it's got no value at all in financial mm -hmm. terms to the to, to this county. It's got a negative value. We've got to maintain it and we've got to repair it. And that is the crucial thing that lies in this. And I, you know, I do hope that we can go forward on this particular pro proposal, subject to some of the things that need to be done further on the case. Thank you, Thank you very much, Councillor James. Uh, any other group leaders? I think both of us want to speak. Okay, well. You want to go first? You want to go? Councillor Chair. Thank you. Uh, very much. Um, just to pick up, actually, perhaps on a couple of points raised by um, uh, previous group leaders, I mean, uh, Councillor James, you're absolutely right, um, and Councillor Matthews, you mentioned this as well. This is a building that was allowed to fall into disrepair under previous Conservative administrations who didn't fund maintenance with the result that the roof fell in four years ago. Uh, that's no, why it's been no, 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 no. Let's, let's allow. Uh, Councillor Charles. Uh, that is. I follow your experience. Right. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Charles. You may. That's why the building has been mothballed because the roof fell in because investment was not made under previous conservative no, 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 no. administrations. 
in maintenance. And so it begs the question whether money will be found to maintain it going forward because everybody is suddenly very keen on investing in this building. Um, but there are some questions around that. Councillor James, you talked about a Gordy Duck Stopping Centre. I mean, the whole idea of the mayoral proposal was to, you know, be part of the regeneration of the high street to bring new uses into a shopping centre, to bring new life into that part of town. So it's, you know, it was explicitly conceived as a mechanism of helping with the regeneration and ensuring the sustainable future of infrastructure that, yes, was built decades ago and now needs to be more multifunctional. Um, uh, the value of it, Councillor James, is £575,000, as we have previously reported to both of the, uh, to both Cabinet and to um, uh, CCSC. Um, and of course, Strava was not considered before as a location for the library because at that point it had the courts in it. So that's why it was not on the table previously and why it's come up as a, uh, as a thing here. And I think just it's kind of helpful for all of us to remind ourselves that the decision on the table before cabinet today is not what is the best thing to do with shy hall because there hasn't been a, a proposal and a kind of range of options explored for what could be done with shy hall as part of this decision process there's just the question of what is the best location for the proposed library is the best location in a place where we've already got the funding, the plans, the detailed design, full planning permission, all of the money necessary to do it, to create a library by 2025 with, you know, with the three million pounds funding of the grant could be fully delivered, or is the best location in a place where we as a council will need to spend at least eight million pounds to make a library happen. Now, you can do a bit of hair splitting about which budget lines that money comes out of, but the reality is it will cost this council at least eight million pounds to get this library into the Shire Hall. And at the end of it, there'll be a very nice assembly hall with a library in it. I'm a bit wary of all of the kind of, you know, the rhetoric about world leading, world class. It's a little bit reminiscent of certain former conservative po politicians who've had a bit of a fall from grace. It might be a very nice library. It might not be world beating. It might be a very nice library room, but it will be just the assembly hall done up within a building that has been made safe for access. And as scrutiny explored in detail on Monday, mm -hmm. there are five projected phases of repair and maintenance work, which would be required to get the thing up to standard. And as a reminder, phase five, which isn't gonna happen until 2029 in the outline plan, is the redecoration of the building, new carpets and so forth. So you'll have a nice posh room at the end of an extremely long corridor, none of that work is going to have been done by then. Phase three involves various repair works and changes to be done to the reception area. So people really need to kind of recognise and understand what we're talking about here. There's a vision and it's beautifully laid out in tens of pages of nice computer projections of what the assembly hall will look like. But this will not bring the whole building back into use. It won't bring it back into all of these kind of uh, opportunities that are that have talked about in rather vague terms, the concrete understanding that we have is that this council will need to spend at least eight million pounds to create that space in the assembly hall and the undercroft, and potentially a number more million pounds. None of that information has been given to us. Now, um, Councillor Lester, thank you for accepting one of the recommendations of uh, CCSC, that is much appreciated. Um, I was keeping a tally as you went through. I think you, uh, yes, where's my number here? I think you um, you managed to um, uh, give partial verbal responses to six paid lip service for two and completely ignored three of our recommendations. But I was um, uh, grateful for the um, comprehensive, uh, well, partially comprehensive responses given by Councillor Stoddart to the detailed questions asked. I mean, I think it's, in, in my view, as uh, on behalf of the Green Group, which is how I am now speaking, it is not acceptable to make a decision to go ahead with this project on the basis of the benefit cost ratio, claiming that the benefit cost ratio is better than they was. It's a completely false analogy to say that the 4.2 million pound repair costs that are necessary in order to put in place the library in Shire Hall to suggest that that is anyway analogous to the investment that was made in Brian Maywood, which is a massive property portfolio, only a small part of which 
is uh, is the library going to go into? And that investment was made before on the basis of its very own business case as watching its own face, generating an income. And that was actually used as co-financing for the Mayor's proposal. It wasn't an additional cost. In fact, one of the one of the points that's been made in this small business case for the Shire Hall is that more of the town's fund money could be spent on fitting out the assembly hall rather than on doing up the building, whereas in Maylords, a bit more of the money was going to have to be spent on sort of accessibility and sorting out various building aspects. But so it's completely false in my view and in my group's view to say that £4.2 million pounds is not an integral part of what has to be the benefit cost calculation. Now, you may make a point that all of the Stronger Towns Fund project, the, the BCRs are calculated in the same way, but we have a responsibility as councillors to include all of the relevant costs in making our own benefit cost calculation. And that calculation must include not just the three million pounds, but also the 4.2 million phase one uh, repairs, and also the nearly 1.1 million pounds uh, aborted costs of cancelling May laws. So we have to be clear, what you're talking about is making a commitment, actually pretty much signing a blank check on this building with the promise of having a nice library in the end of it, <clears throat> a couple of years later than would otherwise have been the case, but without any clarity about everything else that is required to deliver the vision that has been talked about for the wider building. It is necessary to have a conversation about what happens with the shark or long term, in my view and my group's view, that should be done after a decision is made to carry on with the Maylord's project, can be delivered, fully planning committee, fully funded and so forth. Then we can have a thoughtful conversation about what happens with Shire Hall. Having that actually considered that last November, recognise the very, very high cost of bringing the building back into, um, back into use and recognise that, especially at the time of the cost of living crisis, it would be irresponsible for the council to spend so many millions of pounds doing up a building when there are much better things that can be done with that money. Again, in this case, this council could get a library for three million pounds or a library for five to eight million pounds. It should go for the one that's going to cost three million pounds because that is what residents would expect of us and what residents deserve is proper consideration of value for money. Then you can have a conversation about what is best done um, with the Shire Hall. Um, I, I've got all sorts of notes here about sort of detailed comments that uh, various cabinet members made. Um, restoring historic buildings, I've made this point before. The museum building is uh, same, built in the same century as the Shire Hall, and yet it's possible to do it up to NFIT standards. Why is it considered that the Shire Hall can't be treated? with the same degree of thoughtfulness um, about it. But fundamentally, the, the key issue here is value for money. Are you going to spend eight million pounds on a library or three? And the Green Group, on behalf of the Green Group, I strongly urge you to go with the, the option that is clearly far to value for money. And I note that my all of my detailed comments and questions on the benefit cost ratio calculations, the financial case, basically haven't been answered here today. Why are there three additional lines of benefit calculated for the Shire Hall and not for, um, not for May laws? Why have the uh, benefit cost calculations of different types of learners changed in those different things? Why are the utility numbers not calculated and acknowledged for Shire Hall? Mm -hmm. This is a really reckless decision by mm -hmm. the administration that should be paying much more attention to thinking carefully about how to use the resources of taxpayers and residents in this area for the good of residents rather than engaging in what risks being a white elephant at an unknown cost of essentially signing a blank check to bring this building back into the into, into Well, thank you, Councillor. That's in your comments and the expressing views of your group. It's duly noted. Councillor Harvey, last but not least. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I was just watching how cabinet members switched off, started to look at them emails, you know, fiddled about with their phones while Councillor Charles was talking. Just I'll take, ex I'll take exceptions. Yeah, yeah, and so do I. Um, sorry, sorry, Councillor yeah. Harvey. Councillor Harvey, we're all sat here listening to what Councillor Charles has said. 
Yeah, you were fiddling with your phone as well, so yeah. I'm I'm timing this meeting with my phone, Councillor Arby, and I was making notes about what Councillor Charles has said. So please bear us the respect that we deserve. We're not listening with contempt or anything. We are interested to hear what everybody is saying, and I'm really interested to hear what you have got to say now. Okay. Well, here goes. Um, Hereford Library has got a proposed home. And, and that's my Lord Orchard. Um, it, it's not that it, it's getting turfed out of the museum and library building in Broad Street and um, is, is sitting on the pavement, not knowing what its future is going to be. That, that plan um, was put together and the, the cost of the public purse um, of creating that would have been uh, 500K of uh, capital funding. Um, which was approved, um, all of which uh, were been spent as part of some costs, which would be being written off um, if you go ahead and make this decision uh, today. Um, in November 2022, Cabinet considered you know, well advanced and detailed plans for the renovation of the Shire Hall to deliver a civic hub for the Council and for other services and a performance space for community organisations, et cetera, et cetera. And I hope as cabinet members, you've taken the trouble to actually reprise that uh, report and the exempt documents that went alongside it, which give the detail of the costings for the different levels of refurbishment that were considered um, so that you understand um, properly uh, what was there um, and mothballed, put to one side, yes, because at the time um, we felt that it was um, financially reckless to go ahead and make a commitment of um, nearly £8 million pounds, um, to renovate the building at a time when there were such serious unknowns in financial terms to do with the amount of money that we would be needing to spend to bring our children's services back into um, a, a standard that we all hope and expect for, for Herefordshire. Now, that existential risk to the council has not gone away. Um, you guys, I hope, have received your briefing on what the quarter two um, output figures look like, uh, what the forecast is uh, at that stage, and no doubt you've all been involved in discussions on what the, um, the budget is shaping up for for 24-25. You know, I can see officers around the table here looking pretty sick um, at the thought of, of that and what that means. And I know that, um, that the chair uh, of um, Children's Scrutiny and I had a meeting uh, earlier this week with uh, the Director of Children's Services to get a bit of a briefing on um, how things are shaping up in terms of the um, improvement plan um, and the, uh, the cost pressures associated with delivering that improvement plan uh, continue. As yeah, I understand the point it. of all the we're discussing the, the, the agenda item. We've now gone on to children's services. Okay. Yes, we have because yes. you are, by making this decision, if you go ahead and make it, you will be making a de facto commitment. On behalf of this council to spend, as Councillor Chan said, up to £8 million pounds on renovating the Shire Hall without that having gone through the capital programme, without that having gone through full council, you will be, by placing the library in the Shire Hall, be holding this council's arm up its back in committing it to spend that money when there are unknowns or maybe knowns but not publicly shared costs yet to be declared to do with continuing to invest in the journey the improvement journey of children's services um, i gave you all notice ahead of this meeting um, that i would be asking you each to um, confirm that you are um, that you understand both the scale and the source of the funding uh, for the cost commitment um, to renovate the Shire Hall out to completion. That's Act 2029, 
and that you understand the requirement for the additional investments in children's directorate um, and that you are clear where this money is coming from. I do not want this decision to be taken without you each and severally making it clear that it is a sound decision that you are taking, knowing the other pressures that are placed on this council and its services, and that we have the funds available and you know where those funds are coming from in order to deliver the entire project. Independence for Herefordshire were quite prepared to consider the evidence for these two locations, especially given that the court service no longer wishes to return to the building, which was the case back in 2022. However, the way in which the operating costs have been hidden uh, within other council budgets, uh, the cost of renovating the Shire Hall has not been declared. Uh, the lengths that you've gone to in fudging the figures that have been presented and kicking up dust and chaff to obscure the true position, adding to the rhetorical appeals to tradition and emotion in waving Shire Hall like a flag, says, I think, all we need to know. This is an emotional decision. This is a totemic decision for you. This is not a business decision. Now, you're entitled to have totemic and emotional decisions, but be honest about them. This decision is about you as Conservatives trying to make amends for the damage that your previous penny pinching caused um, through lack of maintenance to the Shire Hall. But you need to do it and demonstrate that you're doing it in a way that is not going to damage our children's services or other services that we have to deliver, and that you're going to be able to present a balanced budget to us all in February. So, I would very much like to ask each of you to be clear so that we're not going to be in a position of having this, this decision challenged as being unsound, that you, if you haven't been able to share it with us in the room, that you have had it shared with you and you are making this decision in the full knowledge of where this money is coming from for the full Shire Hall development and that you understand what the ask is going to be in terms of the additional investment in children's services to deliver the improvement journey that's required. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Harvey. Thank you very much for those comments. So when we come to make our deliberation today, as I said, we were going to, um, with, with my recommendation, to make a decision that uh, deletes the uh, line D so there are three recommendations before us uh, to be taken on block. Um, and you've heard the views of the group leaders. And you've heard um, the, you, you had an opportunity to discuss the recommendations from the scrutiny committee. Um, <coughs> just heard from Councillor Harvey that, you know, she would like uh, the, the decision that we're going to make to be uh, fully cognizant of all of the other financial responsibilities that uh, we have as a council. Uh, so when you're making your uh, decision, please bear that in mind. And that's the, the, the open challenge that Council Hart has made to us, and I uh, respect that challenge. Um, but we have to make a decision based on the report before us and the, and the business case before us. And we have to make that with regard to, as I say, the best outcome for the library. So, if there are, are there any other further comments before we, oh, Councillor Ross. Um, I find what um, you two ladies down there have said um, quite a challenge because you started off, uh, Councillor Jones, by starting your 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 long talk about the roof falling on the Shire Hall. Then you had to go with conservatives who were fallen from grace. You went on to all sorts of things. And Captain Harvey, you started about this record spend of eight million pounds on this building. 
I just wonder, having got this budget that we are now struggling with at the moment, this was a budget that was passed in February this year. It's not balanced. You're telling us we've got to balance the budget for next February. This is a challenge. We are fully cognizant that doing the budget at this moment in time is the most difficult thing that this council has probably ever come up against, and every other council in the land as well. You, you're extremely really trying to teach your grandmother to suck eggs here. We are well aware of this. But I have to recommend just come back to you for the four years that I wasn't a councillor here. You managed a council um, a bypass that was fully um, going along um, correctly within the process, and that cost 22 million quid. You could argue, you know, I could argue that that was recklessly uh, spent money. Um, that this council is is struggling to get infrastructure in place because that money was um, thrown away. So I'm responding directly to you. If I've got to listen to you going on and on and on about all of the things that the Conservative previous administration did, don't be surprised if I react because I will react. I don't like reacting, and I'm I, I'm careful about what I say. Um, in private, I would react very much stronger. But in this case, we've had a good debate about this this um, Shire Hall in the library. We've had um, a challenge about the finances around it. We've had a challenge about the children's services. We've had challenges in every which way. We are absolutely sure. And I don't think I've ever put so much time as a councillor into uh, day over day over day in considering all of these things. And I don't appreciate the way that you have formed your opinion from your groups to us. If you're going to get political about it, don't be surprised if they come back to vote you. But at this moment in time, I was not happy with many of the things you said. And when you looked at me directly, when you said about the council, oh, we're not lost interest in what council chairman said, we're looking at the email and what have you. I, I've written a page of notes here about what council chairman said. I've added a page of what council Harvey said, and I've got very little else. Oh, Councillor Matthews supports the principal, put a tick by him because that's all I needed to put. But I've got all of the things that you said, and bear in mind that I sat through your scrutiny for two and a half hours the other day, and we've taken note of what you said, and we've discussed them, and the officers have helped us to get the, the resulting answers for you. You're not happy with them now that we've discussed them. So I'm in a difficult place with what you're saying because you're challenging us on what we are doing when we're in difficult times. And these difficult times are just as much your responsibility as it is ours. Well, John, to challenge you. Yeah, um, thank you very much. And thank you very much for those comments. I'm keen to progress and move on to the recommendation, as I said, recommendations A to C. Uh, Councillor Brayden, did you want to recommend? I would just like to say that uh, I, I was delighted to hear the comment forward by Councillor Stoddard with regard to the refuting of many of the, uh, uh, the many of the um, uh, items that have brought forward the scrutiny, and I'm thankful for the uh, his decision to work there. And I would say that uh, it's quite clear that the members of the cabinet appear to be as adamant as I am that this is the best thing that should have happened. Uh, the Shire Hall, and it could ever have happened for the Shire Hall to move the library and learning centre to it. But I would like to propose strongly that we accept this. Thank you. Okay, and uh, I'll second that recommendation. Um, so, can we all vote show of hands, please? Okay, thank you very much. That's unanimous. Okay, um, and we'll move on to um, item eight, which is the Next item on the agenda, which is the legal committee to the financial arrangements for PDRP. This is the report to provide information in respect of the council's contractual uh, arrangements about the BT living uh, places and update cabinet on progress made following recommendations made by the external auditors in the auditors' annual report, the year ending 31st of March 2022. This item begins on page 323 of the agenda pack. Um, this has had a political consultation on the 25th of October and has been published as a supplement. And uh, Councillor Durkin, would you like to make some comments, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, there was a briefing meeting held yesterday regarding both the next two items, which I was at. And I think those that attended will, will come to listen. 
with regard to this paper here, the legal status of financial aid with Balfour Peter, I'm going to make a couple of salient points that should be noted by uh, the cabinet and uh, External auditors have recommended that the council establish the validity of contractual and training arrangements of its publicly owned contract with BBLB. We took legal advice, external, and it was confirmed that the council was not fundamentally exposed and that the contract was not invalidated by the arrangements, but noted that issues could arise in the event of a major dispute between parties. Balfour Beatty's company secretary has informed that Balfour Beatty has an active company status and makes company returns as a dormant company under the Companies Act. Following the receipt of Balfour Beatty's response, further legal advice was taken and received in June 23, and it confirmed that the dormant company status was not unusual. The, company, the council has verified that the parent company guarantee is in place within the public realm contract. The risks are recorded and monitored for this through the Department of Risk Register, which is assessed and reviewed monthly. The Council has undertaken a fundamental review of the arrangements, which has confirmed that these are legally compliant. Now, these are important matters taken out on the report. I would like to say that we are working together with Balfour BT as well and collaboratively. And I would like to thank the officers and Balfour BT officers for their hard work and continued discussions. And I'm convinced that this will continue. So, my recommendations are that we note the contractual arrangements in respect to the Council Public Realm contract with Balfour BT in place and its agency company status. And do we note recommendations made, made by the external auditors in respect to this arrangement and actions are taken by the council. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Um, do, do any cabinet members have any points they wish to raise at this item? If not, um, been, this matter has not been um, covered by uh, any scrutiny. Um, but anyway, should we go to uh, group leaders for their thoughts. That's <laughs> James. Yeah, uh, I realize this is a legal matter, status, etc. But I am very concerned about the performance and our control over the performance of Balfour Um It's just in the, we talk about the financial restrictions that we'll be having over the coming years. And, it's going to be very, very tight. What we're getting for what we pay is just not good enough. And many people throughout the county see it on a day to day basis. And something has to be done about that. How? I'm not in the position to really say at this particular moment. But we need something much, much better than the arrangement we've got with both. Thank you, Councillor James. I think you're sold in your thunder for the next point. The next item. <laughs> 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 I'm going to allow you to come back in and continue. <laughs> I'll just say ditto. <laughs> I think, I think that what we're trying to tease out here is the um, the company status. I know. Uh, and and uh, so there we go. Councillor Matthews, I think you've got some of Yeah. <clears throat> If I can either refer to legal implications, uh, uh, paragraph 35, the council must ensure that the contract is robustly managed and appropriately scrutinized and reviewed to ensure that its specific statutory duties are met and also that the council wider duty to obtain best value in the provision of all services is satisfied. I agree with the previous speaker. This is not happening under the present system. And I'll give you an example, colleagues, of a job at Crendill. Um, I raised uh, privately, not council money, 40,000 pounds for a bus shelter, because we couldn't raise the money then. <clears throat> and so we worked with uh, a developer who built eight houses, so there was no 106 claim, and the council had no proof we had to handle it ourselves. And we, we got the job done, and there was uh, this is what perturbed me, which I want to bring to your attention, Councillor Jerkin. 
Um, there were four dead elm trees about a foot across the base and about 18 foot high. Dead, perfectly easy to drop. You and I could have done it in a few hours one morning and just um, block it. In. <laughs> <laughs> now, can, can I come and watch? <laughs> Hang on, let's let Barbara Beatty sent eight men to do that job. Three or four of them were sat on the grass in the field all day. Then they strolled up the church for a walk. And the trouble is, when I said to them, Look, why are you wasting time like this? They said, Look, councillor, the management say to us, You've got a day to complete that job. And they tell us, Go and do it. He said, that's where it's all wrong. The jobs aren't assessed properly at management, and therefore it's, you know, it's costing the council quite three times as much as what it should be. So we're definitely not getting value for money. Mm -hmm. So I have great concerns like what well, and the standard of work. I don't know whether we've got a system in place where uh, projects are checked afterwards to make sure that they've been completed to a high standard. <clears throat> Because I don't think that takes place now so rigidly as it used to. And again, uh, we're quite right. It's always fine saying that they're delivering a reasonable service. I, I don't rely that in some aspects they probably are. But there's so much waste and, and going on that the taxpayer sees what's going on and they wrap our door to do something about it. So I hope we take those matters into consideration and try and address them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. I, I think you again um, made the comments about the next agenda item, um, uh, and so, but we, we hear you loud and clear. So thank you for that, uh, Councillor Harvey. Would you like to comment on the um, on, on the uh, status of the uh, company? Yes, I, I, I'll do my best to comment on the agenda item that we're discussing. Oh, that's good news. Um, yeah, it, it, as one of the cabinet members um, in place at the time when we received these comments from the external auditors, it was rather frustrating um, to have them nitpick over this particular issue um, when it has been the name under which Balfour Beatty have um, marketed themselves, positioned themselves uh, in the local government um, service delivery um, sector um, since they started providing services to the council. Um, I don't know what our external auditors were doing for every year that um, Bath Beatty Living Places were calling themselves such uh, when they, they didn't take issue with it. But um, when they woke up and smelled the coffee, um, they made the comments that they did, and at the time, our officers were very clear that this was not an issue, this was not a risk to the council, um, and we'd gone to a lot of trouble and expense, um, getting external opinions on this, and lo and behold, it's not an issue if we do this. So, you know, nothing to see here, move along please. You know, I think there is a, you know, there's a useful job that the external auditors perform. Um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate uh, the work that they do in fulfilling that. Um, this, my opinion, um, was not their finest hour. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. Nothing to see here, take the point. <laughs> uh, Councillor Charles. Thanks. I'll also comment on the report in front of us, not the next one, save my comments for that. And it's a, a brief just question about the structure of the report. So I note that this uh, decision report doesn't have an environmental implications section, as most, well, all other reports do, apart from item nine also doesn't have an environmental implications section. Why is that? Because this report does have equality, community, etc. And they will say there is not, you know, there's there are no implications. So why has the report format changed? And can it be changed to be consistent for all reports as it was? Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Chairman. I think we need to get clarification from officers as to why that was not included in the report. Um, I think uh, the company status is probably not 
then she just read, I think that the next item, version nine, it, it can have some uh, implications, so we'll get clarifications to where those got get. Yeah, and it's just it, it it's a it's a formal thing that all of our cabinet reports should have the same. There should be one template. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Well made. Any more comments? Uh, if not, uh, there's the recommendations. Councillor uh, Durkin is looking at those recommendations. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Stoddard. Um, and we have the, you know, the two recommendations in front of us A and B. All those second. Okay. Any against? Councillor Durkin, you want to Okay, so we move on to the next item, um, which is the public realm, the realm contract extension. This report is to approve the extension of the public realm service <coughs> contract to develop BT living places in line with the contract terms and conditions and provide an update on contract management arrangements. This item is on page 367 of the agenda. It's held a political consultation on the 25th of October and has been and that has been published as a supplement. Once again, Councillor Durkin, would you like to make some comments? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I would. Um, again, I'm highlighting a few key matters that must be understood within the report. Um, the contract extension. The contract commenced in 2013, as we all know, for the initial 10 years. It was extended by one year in 2018, um, and that took us to August 2024. The two extensions of one year are now due to August 2026 in course of the contract. External orders that raise concern about the value for money in the contract in 2020. The general leader of life to see that the council does not have sufficient grounds not to award the extensions on the external audit that's concerned. There are a number of ongoing commercial financial performance issues with the PBLP. Uh, further commercial projects being applied uh, for BT living places to improve performance and evidence value for money. The improvements made for an external report that saw the separation commissioning and contract management now be recognized by SWAP, our internal auditors. Further work is ongoing to close out phase two of the major contracts improvement board improvement plan. The contract has have the ability for the council to issue a two-year notebook termination. The future operating model project is in progress and scheduled for reporting its findings in the cabinet in March 2024. All these issues regarding value for money, etc., are currently being looked at and actively reviewed. I can attest to that. Again, I'd like to I'd like to thank the officers on both, both organisations for their hard work on this. And it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an easy walk in the park. So our recommendations are the extensions of the awards for a total of two years. That the closeout of the improvement plan is noted, and that contract management agreements are also noted. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. Do you have any? Councillor again. Thank you. Um, I think all of us would probably agree that there are um, issues regarding um, Balfour meeting um, in some way or another. And um, I, I think for me, um, I just want some assurance that the KPIs that the Balfour are working to at the present moment in time, which I believe personally probably are outdated um, and probably is why they are able to say that they meet them 100%, will be reviewed as part of the review of the contracts going forward. Um, and that in turn should hopefully include the service that's being provided by the organisation. And that be confirmed. Yes. Um, uh, I yes, thank you for that. Um, I know it's been working. Well. I'll ask uh, well, yeah, Mark, Mark will do not that. Mark, yeah. to, to give an understanding regarding the current status of the KPIs and their progress. Okay, uh, Mr. Mark Apple, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the 
EPOM adjudicators are an integral part of the contract, so they're enshrined in the contract mm -hmm. and change them. We have issues. Sorry, sorry, Mark, that's not on. Sorry, Mark. Apologies. Mm -hmm. Thanks, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. It looks on. That's it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's got a red button. Try and Ross's. That's it. So the KPIs did work out that the KPIs <laughs> are a um, an integral part of the contract, and, and we, we obviously have to agree though the BBRP and, and those those are reviewed on a, on a not frequent enough basis, in my opinion. Um, we have issued a um, an early warning to BBRP telling them that the KPIs for next year need to reflect where we are now with the contract and not where we were five years ago. <laughs> BBRP may choose not to to want to agree to those changes, in which case we will have to refer back to the 2021 um, indicator set that we currently have. It's a, it's a contractual decision. It's, it's one both parties have to agree to in terms of changing the KPIs. So it's a business decision for, for them to take. It does, it does mean that we, we then have to look at other options available to us if we're not getting the performance that required from the contract. It's in BBRP's interest to, to work with us to get an indicator set that best reflects what we as a council and VBLP as a business help them to, to drive the performance out of the contract. Thank you very much, Mark. Okay, um, any more comments from the <coughs> issues that cabinet wishes to raise before we make the decision? No, if not, we'll go to group leaders. Um, group leaders want to speak, Councillor Harvey. Um, yes, and you've already heard from Councillor James and Councillor Matthews on the phone. Um, yeah, when um, when we inherited um, the, yeah, the contract in 2019, it was a mess, absolute mess. Um, you know, we weren't able to demonstrate that we were getting value for money because there hadn't been any um, work completed at all. Um, it, it, the easy route had been taken and work had just been shoveled across the Balfability for them just to deliver under the uh, under the contract. Um, we as a council ended up with a qualified opinion from the external auditors just as a consequence of that. And although that doesn't sound particularly bad, actually, in accounting terms, that's pretty really serious. And it's taken us a while to dig ourselves back out of that situation. Um, and the work that's gone on, both with the audit report that was under the, uh, under the previous item, and the work that's gone on with, uh, with officers and a number of members of the previous cabinet, um, working to try and uh, you know unpick things and get things back on an even keel. Um, you know, you can see in this report here some of the problems that we've had to face. Paragraph fifteen. You know, operational performance indicators were last agreed in July 2016. You know, somebody was asleep at the wheel. You know, these performance indicators need to be kept up to date, as Mr. Admiral said, and to be relevant to the current operating circumstances. And quite frankly, it's pretty outrageous that, you know, it's, a, it's written into the contract that Balfour Beatty can you know, refuse to have them changed. You know, looking ahead, you know, perhaps they don't want a new contract. I don't know. But, you know, it, it gives a very clear <laughs> message to me. If they're sitting there saying, we're not going to agree to revise these KPIs, that, you know, because they haven't been revised for such a long time, and they're, you know, measuring the wrong things, they can hit it every time, 100%, ding, 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 you know, and get their performance, you know, uplift and whatever else. They don't get any penalties. Um, you know, it's just indicative of how this contract was mismanaged. And to be clear, it was mismanagement of this contract because we've had it externally assessed and it's come back as being in its in and of itself, a good contract of its type. You know, the contract is, is sound. The way it's been stuck together is good. The way it talks about us working and them working is good. 
What hasn't been good is this council has not been a good customer, you know, and we've ended up bleeding away all the domain experts on the council side to the point where we were not an intelligent customer. We weren't capable of even recognising where we weren't getting value for money, where they were doing a bad job, you know, and basically they were writing their own checks, you know, leading us a bit of a dance. Now, you know, if now you guys are back in the hot seats, please keep your eye on the road, you know, in every sense of the word. And, you know, let's get some improved key performance indicators pushed through and agreed with Balfour Beatty, you know, as things stand, because they can hit them ding, 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 where we are not in a position not to offer them contract extensions. But, you know, to the point where that finishes, you know, we've got a small amount of time, and it, it might sound, it might feel like a lot, a lot of time, but it isn't in contract terms, particularly if we're going to have to prepare to tender this, you know, broadly with others, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, let's use that time wisely and let's see if we can, you know, be a good customer, but a tough customer. You know, when we're the customer, you know, the customer needs to understand its business sufficiently to know what it wants and to say what it wants well so that the, the contractor can deliver to time and to cost. So let's get good at being a customer. We've set some really good foundations over the last four years. You know, what you've got to do is just <laughs> carry on and, you know, deliver on it now, please. Thank you very much, Councillor Harvey. Um, so you didn't uh, mention uh, our former colleague, uh, John Harrington, who I know worked very hard on this issue. Um, Councillor Jones. Thank you. Um, uh, I've got a couple of specific questions and then some, some general comments, which is specifically on paragraph 10. Actually, before, I'll just preface this by saying, like, you know, I feel quite a lot of sympathy for the cabinet member who has to deal with this contract and the officers who have to deal with this contract. It's an area of kind of, you know, where, as we've heard, everybody feels that <laughs> the roads are not being managed well enough. And so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, frustration around about that and um, I recognise it's hard it's hard to fix and in fact I think I read this report as explaining some of the reasons why it's hard to fix and um, uh, paragraph 10 I don't know if the cabinet member can um, tell us why don't we have um, uh, FPI to call the indicator data for 2022-23 because that year finished six months ago so do we not have that data? Mark, do you have any details for that, please? Mr. Admiral? And I'll go to Dave, who's on the screen. No, right, that's okay. Okay, mm -hmm. Mr. Martin, did you hear that question? I did, yes, thank you, Leader. Um, the, the performance data for the, the last year will be due in about November time this year. There's a period of lag between getting all the information so they can report it, so we'll be expecting that from BBLP imminently. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. I mean, that does seem like quite a long lag. You know, most of the following year is taken to gather the information on the performance. As a council, we managed to publish quarterly performance reports. You know, can we not expect a, a, a quicker publication of performance data from our contractors, please? Um, so I don't need you to ask for that right now, but as a, as a future thing, wouldn't that be nice? Second specific question on this is that I note quite a significant decline in performance between 2020-21 and 2021-22. Um, I just wonder why that is. Okay, and, and was, there a third, was there a third question? Sorry. Uh, there's a, yeah, there's a third question and yeah. then there's a general commentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, we'll just have a third question and then... We'll... So the third question is on, you know, why the minimum performance level required is only nine? when Balfour Beatty appears to be able, you know, quite easily to meet much higher performance levels, which indicates that the, you know, the specification of the benchmark is 
way, way, way to go. Why was it only set at nine? Okay. The original contracts. Okay, we'll get clarification on that. Um, and then the general commentary, really, or, or the more general question, I suppose, is that it seems quite clear, especially from paragraphs um, uh, 15 and uh, 16 and, and quite a number of other places, that there is just, that this is a contract which doesn't give the council enough power um, to, to run the contract. Essentially, as colleagues have pointed out, you know, Bath and Beauty get to mark their own homework, they get to set their own standards. We appear to be unable, reading between the lines here, we've been trying to drive up standards and Bath and Beauty have just been saying, sorry guys, no. You know, in in, in what other contractual relationship is that, you know, is, is that really allowed? It appears that we have no choice but to offer the two, the two contract extensions. But, what assurance can you give me, cabinet member and officers, that preparation is in place now to ensure that the next time we have the opportunity to sign a new contract, not only will we be better at managing it on the day-to-day, -day, but also we will ensure that it is a contract that doesn't tie us into a, effectively a relatively powerless position. And again, I want to specify that there are many good people working at BBLP. I spent the morning with one looking at the mapping data and kind of, you know, the decision-making behind what what really goes on on a day to day basis. But fundamentally, it can't be right that we have so little power as a council to actually ensure that performance is driven up. At the very least, we should be specifying continuous improvement. And if we're working with such a, a, a low baseline, we, you know, something went very wrong back in 2013 when this contract was originally signed, potentially. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We, we, we've got um, we have two, two further points. One about the decline in performance, and the other one was about the minimum level nine. Can we have some clarification on those points, please? Dave, you can cover off the performance drop, please. That'd be useful, and I'll cover off the, the rest of it. Mr. Martin, thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the drop in performance is actually just a result of the method of calculation year on year. Um, again, the, the way the contract is structured, uh, it, it doesn't really look at the, the trend in performance in that way. It's a simple pass-go, really, in respect that um, for the contract extensions and the performance, the, the key target is nine. Um, I'm unsure as to why nine was set as the baseline for the contract, but that's clear within the contract that the performance um, levels that are attainable are on are, are nine and above. And BBLP have been overachieving that um, in each year of assessment. <clears throat> I can do some further work to try and understand that and do a further report back if that's helpful. Yeah. You see clarification if you course that would be helpful because this it's not going to go away, uh, go away in the minds of the answer the question. Answer the question on why but he was going to go away and find out why it was nine, but I don't think it answers the question as to why it's dropped between 2020 and 2021. No, no, I think that was Strathmore said to pick up that point. No, I thought it was other way around. No, no, so, so, Dave, Mr. Martin will be going back to look at why the, the trend has, has dropped. That's what I thought. Um, no, okay. yeah, and, and the nine is a number that, unfortunately, none of us involved now will understand no because it was set in the original contract and it would have been assumed at that point in time. <laughs> Nine was a reasonable number for the provider to be able to achieve. The fact that the provider's gone well beyond nine indicates that we should have been looking in the interim years of moving that target backwards and making it more robust. Okay. Sorry, but just particularly the fact that the provider easily goes beyond nine and yet the users of the service are not satisfied indicates that it really, you know, we ought to be able to be driving it up. <laughs> I think that's an excellent point to raise. Right. Can you use the microphone if you would? Uh, sorry, the, the other really thing really I. Say, that's the only but it's just, I don't understand bearing in mind that 2020, 2021 was during the pandemic. I can't work out how that can possibly be. They reached a higher percentage during the pandemic. <laughs> When they probably were actually working, okay. than they did in 21 22. Right. I'll, I'll watch it. Watch it to be a two counter. Uh, James is at least having that. 
<laughs> Thank you. There are lies, down lies, and form of data. Um, <laughs> um, I just think, you know, we're not managing the performance of the club, and the Council of Channels actually touched upon it very strongly. And I'll give you an example. We had 106 money for a new uh, crossing at the school. We've got a very dangerous uh, car park, which is adjacent to a busy road, and there's no uh, crossing on that particular crossing. We had the money from 106 money. It was agreed for three years ago. I, I looked at the plans and supported the plans three years ago. It was agreed. It's been prevaricated and met for nearly three years now. And what happens? Two months ago, Bell could come and say, oh, there isn't enough money to do it now. Inflation and time has, has pushed it about the cost of the money we've been had from the 106. So children are now being put in danger by the failure to manage the contract and manage the 106 money. Now, that's a failure of the council and of Balfour Beatty. And if any child is injured, God forbid, um, any more than that in the coming years, it will be the responsibility of this council and Balfour Beatty. Because when one gets the contract, everything is agreed, and everything is done, plans are agreed, and then it's kicked down the road for, for years, and we end up having to pay much more money for it because inflation has taken care of that, and we get less for our money. Now, is that good management? No. And the sooner that is sorted out and the council manage of the meeting, as they should do, the better. Thank you, Councillor Jensen and Councillor Matthews. Yeah, only well, very briefly, uh, previous speakers yeah. mentioned about we haven't got the powers to oversee and enforce these contracts. Surely, if these contracts are drawn up adequately and as they should be, we should have those powers to make sure that the things are delivered and we should have the powers to be able to enforce it. And if not, you know, uh, deal with it. But to hear people repeatedly saying we haven't got them, could I have? Cabinet member or legal comment on that to see if that's uh, found out to be the case and what are they doing about it? Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Um, sorry, we you wanted to pick up that point that Councillor Matthews has made. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, Leader. Um, so, Councillor Matthews and, and Councillor Chams, um, in terms of the ability of the contract to, to for us to direct, um, Councillor Harvey referenced the review that was undertaken in terms of the contract. Uh, the contract is a very good contract. It manages the contractor, it manages the relationship between the contractor and the commissioner. What we've failed to do in the past is commission in a robust enough fashion. So we haven't cliented as well as we ought. We've let our provider take the lead and determine what that provider wants to go and do. <clears throat> Hopefully over these past couple of years, you'll have noticed a change in how we've operated with Alpha BT and how we've, we've moved away from that. You tell us what you want to go and do and we'll give you an order for it to actually we're now going to look at more closely what you're proposing we're, we're looking to do next year in amongst the priorities we know we've all got and does that fit what the council wants us to go and deliver? In terms of the Section 106 works, we recognised that problem a number of years ago, and that work is now dealt with by the PMO using a separate separate um, contract. And I acknowledge that some of the teams will have, will have got to the point where they're, they're no longer deliverable, but we are now in a much better position than 106 for delivery of schemes by the Programme Management Office and um, ACOM as a consultant and using a, a framework of other contractors to undertake the works. Okay, right. Um, um, I'm keen to move on to the recommendations. It's been proposed by well, it's been proposed by uh, Councillor Durkin. Grant seconder, please. Councillor Brayler, thank you very much. All those in favour of the recommendations. Okay, thank you very much. We can now move on to the last item on the agenda, which is the transition of. Uh, um, the transition of the functions of the Marshes uh, Local Enterprise Partnership. This report is to establish the required arrangements 
to transition functions from the largest uh, the global price partnership to commence from April 2024, following a government's announcement in August 2023 that they will no longer provide funding to LEPS the functions to be uh, alternatively led by local authorities. The item on the agenda is page three, starts at page 383 of the agenda pack. And uh, I would invite like Councillor Bates to address uh, the committee in the uh, Thank you. Thank you, Leader. I've got um, my introduction is slightly longer than the paper in front of you, I think, on this, but, um, but bear with me. Um, on the 4th of August, the government communicated their decision to no longer fund local enterprise partnerships and functions to transfer to local authorities from April 2024. The recommendation pr um, proposes establishing a joint committee of the local authorities made up of the leaders of the three councils to provide the government structure required by government to oversee the transition arrangement. Shropshire Council remain the accountable body for LEP activities, both now and going forward through the transition period. There are no financial implications for the creation of a joint committee, the Herefordshire Council. Any transfer of activities will be subject to further cabinet decisions. We recognise, and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the LEP board for their contribution in implementing the government grants and service over the last something over 20, 10 years now. However, it's now an opportunity to ensure that future services are locally focused in meeting the needs of our heritage business. Thank you very much, Councillor Bates. Any other cabinet members wish to make any comments on the proposals? No. Um, if not, I'll invite group leaders. Would they like to um, express the views of their group on this agenda item? Uh, Councillor Charles. <coughs> Thanks. Yes, um, Councillor Biggs, I you know, share your thanks to members of the LEP and officers of the LEP who worked hard um, over a number of years to support not just Herefordshire but other authorities and transfer of funding to central government. Um, I think, and I, I welcome the bringing of funding more directly to local authorities. I think one of the issues that we have with long term funding of capital projects particularly, but this actually applies to revenue budgets too, is the lack of long-term multi-year funding settlements to local authority. And that means that we end up with what locally gets referred to as beauty contests for projects. And authorities across the country spend large amounts of time, energy, resources, effort, and in fact money preparing proposals the capital projects against you know to contest with other authorities and then only a small number of them get funded and we've seen that happen time and time again and so i'd like to ask you and i'd like to ask the leader please to do everything that you can to lobby central government to use this opportunity of more direct transfer of funding to local authorities to also put in place a multi-year sustainable funding mechanisms for local authorities and the transparent allocation of funding on the basis of some sort of calculation that you know takes into account things like infrastructure requirements and demographics and you know all sorts of things that probably need to be taken into account rather than the beauty contest um, approach to allocation of funding because what authorities need is that consistency of funding streams that ability to plan for the future they need we need to have the taking away of the artificial deadlines if you've got to spend this by March next year, otherwise it will be kind of drawn back to the Treasury. And I think we need clarity about the long term outcomes that are required from capital investment, for example, transition to net zero. But we need flexibility for local authorities to identify what are the key opportunities um, for investment locally, taking into account local circumstances. So please will you use any and every opportunity that you have to lobby uh, central government to ensure that we get that type of long-term sustainable funding mechanism rather than the drip, 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 because there's a risk that even if the, you know, the infrastructure of funding allocation may change to take away the let, we may still have the same drip, drip, drip of little dollops of capital funding here and there that authorities are still competing for. Thank you. Um, you want to take that on, leader? Um, in, term, in terms of that, I um, welcome your 
sort of support, I think, for what we're, what we're talking about here in terms of moving it more local, more local decision making. And I'll take on board the comments and um, valuable comments. <clears throat> Yes, I mean, uh, uh, just add to that because you asked insurance. I think that the the challenge in the past has been that it's set up authorities against one another in trying to get funding. And I think that there is greater clarity and greater certainty about the funding mechanisms. And I think you're right to request that the government set up that framework uh, more so than the, the, the previous arrangements. And so I'm very happy to uh, take on board that, that recommendation. Um, Councillor Harvey, I think you said you wanted to be next. Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, I, I welcome the demise of the yeah, the lab. Um, I'm glad that the government has decided that it's one of their experiments that's run its course. It's more than run its course, in my opinion. Um, I agree with everything that um, what Councillor Chowns has said. You know, we we don't want to be. Uh, and people one another, you know, fair funding for local authorities who are then allowed to be the grown ups that they are and decide what's right for their communities um, is clearly a better way of doing things. Um, you know, and we have the scrutiny, we have the oversight, we have the requirement to be um, open and transparent in what we're doing and properly to record. What we're doing and to keep those records up to date. Um, I think the LEPs have not had the um, the, the level of um, oversight and uh, the rigor in terms of their record keeping. Um, certainly in their early days, um, that should have been necessary and should have been put in place. Um, so uh, the quicker we can transition from where we are now to the new way of working, the better. And I really just hope that as a consequence of, um, of uh, funding being managed by the local authorities themselves, that we don't end up with a continuation of what has historically been with the, the LEP, quite a Hereford-centric approach to the investment of funds and that more broadly other areas of the county benefit. And I think, you know, when it came to some of the um, investment calls that government made um, recently for the levelling up funding, um, it was really apparent from the, the, the opportunities that we had in terms of rather unpleasantly termed shovel ready uh, projects, particularly for the um, North Herefordshire constituency, um, that there just wasn't, that there weren't the projects there ready to go with, you know, in an instant, which is what government seems to demand these days. So if by returning funds to local authorities that we get the capacity to maybe do some of that thought leadership and put some of that work in advance so that we do have um, our ideas properly set out and, and formulated, um, we can maybe respond more effectively when government continues to knee jerk as it will inevitably do. Um, but maybe we can be better prepared for that than we've been able to in the past. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. Uh, Councillor James. Yeah. Just a, you know, a, it's a step in the right direction. Um, but uh, uh, caution against you know we're twelve months away from an election, general election. And what, the thing I've learned over the years is that not no organisation like this, and there have been so many, so many over the years from LEPs, regional authority advantage, West Midlands, mm. um, uh, regional assembly. You know, I could list other. Yeah. They never seem to last more than two or three years. And we've got another one, another a government or a new minister has a different idea of how things have, have to be managed, which I think is a curse of the long term because, you know, uh, no sooner are they doing, getting things right than they're abolished. So, you know, but this is nearer to the, the way in which it should be managed. So, uh, fingers crossed. Thank you very much. And Councillor Matthews. Yeah, just very briefly, there seems to be general support, but. Uh, it's the right way forward to bring things more under local control. 
We just have to wait and see how it works out. Thank you very much, Gaza uh, Matthias. Uh, short and sweet, but to the point. Um, okay, so we have the proposal before us, um, proposed by Councillor Biggs. We have some proposed, we have Sally there. Yep, Councillor Stoddard, thank you very much. So the recommendations A and B are before us. All in favour? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, item nine is to the meeting, so I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and for everyone's contributions, including group leaders. Thank you very much. Uh, I confirm that the next meeting scheduled for 2.30 on November the 23rd. I'll now formally close the meeting. All members of the public are requested to leave the building promptly. Please ensure that you have taken all of your personal